welcome to Field Sports Britain. Coming up, stars of TV and sports. We're talking optics with survivalist Ray Mears. The greater the magnification, the greater the understanding. I think that, that's, a, that's almost a rule of nature. We're talking rods and reels with angling TV presenter so John Wilson. Then we have the not so famous but just as important David Taylor of the Countryside Alliance talking and shooting fallow deer. This is uh, free range deer and certainly, certainly not horse. First, it's a charity shoot in North Yorkshire where England international rugby player Tom Wood is talking bows and his Saints colleague Scott Armstrong is talking stalking. This is one charity event where you have to wonder what personal sacrifice has actually been made by the people who've come along to support it. On this South Yorkshire Moor, for the price of a charitable donation, you can rattle your grey cells with a 50 cal. Challenge your shooting skills by firing as many rounds as you can at targets out to 800 yards, eat your fill of great food, and it's all taking place in a safe environment surrounded by experts and backstops. And if shooting bores you, there's even a chance to have a chat about these six nations with a couple of rugby players. And we're not talking local league players here, we're talking boys at the top of their game, like England international Tom Wood. He's found a quiet place to practice shooting his bow, only to be interrupted by sporting shooter editor Dom Holtam, who is at the other end of the athletic spectrum. And you, you started off with the rifle side of things, and that's how you got to know Chris, um, but you actually used the bow shooting as part of your rehabilitation from injury, like to kind of, you know, to take you away from rugby and yeah, uh, that's basically how I justify it. Yeah, um, yeah, I've tried to convince them to get one in the physio room. Um, I had shoulder trouble in the past, and um, I've actually found that shooting the bow over a period of time has helped set my shoulder in a stronger position and develop the smaller muscles around the shoulder that help with rugby tackling and the, you know, the bangs you take on a weekly basis. Um, so I've benefited in that in that way. But um, you know, I had a, had a long-standing injury in my foot, which um, you know was quite debilitating. I couldn't do all the things I usually do, running around, playing rugby. Um, you know, surfing and any other activities I like to do. So, um, you know, I took up archery, which is a bit more static, and uh, and it just you know, went from there, really. And and do you find you're keen on your your country sports and, and being out with the rifle and stuff? Do you, do you find that it's a nice escape from the the pressures of, of your professional sport, but also you know the, the attention of the media? Yeah, exactly that. Yeah, I mean, I'm an outdoorsy person anyway. I like being out, out and about doing sort of the, the field sports and country pursuits and things. So, um, you know, I'm really comfortable in that environment. And yeah, it's just a real break from the uh, from the pressures of professional rugby and, and the media and everything else. So um, apart from today, obviously. Well, you know, we always like to intrude wherever possible. <laughs> yeah. The day is organised by Chris Blackburn of custom gun maker UK Gunworks and his wife Pippa. Their son Jack fell ill and died in 2010, just days before his first birthday. With the generosity and support of companies like Zeiss and Rivers West donating raffle prizes together with friends and family, they have created a shooting event that celebrates Jack's life and raises money for the hospital that tried to save him. We're here primarily to raise money for the Northampton General Hospital. Um, that's where Jack was born and then where we, where we lost him, so all the money that we raise goes there. Last year um, it went towards a heart machine for the children's ward, which they've now bought and is being used on the ward. Um, this year I don't know what piece of equipment it will go to, but it will be something on the children's ward. It's being used by poorly children, you know, for years exactly, to come. Exactly right, yeah. And obviously you couldn't do this event without support from the industry and, and you know, it, it's been very well supported this event, hasn't it? Absolutely, it's sponsored again by Zeiss this year um, and again by lots of um, suppliers, we've got the raffle prizes. Again, a really good mix, rugby shirts, rugby balls, uh, scopes, rangefinder, um, dinners out, loads of things, yeah. Okay, so uh, the guys have been banging away for about an hour, if you'll pardon the expression. You can see just over my shoulder here, we've got a firing position and they're shooting out to targets six, 700 yards away. We've got another firing position just down here to my right. Um, they've got some close range targets which is suitable for the rim fires and then they've got some longer range steel gongs across the valley about 400 yards and then some other ones at about six or 700 yards. Just over the cameraman's shoulder we've got England rugby star Tom Wood playing with his bow on the bow range. They've got targets out to about 80 yards there. 
But Chris Blackburn, who organised the day, a little bit earlier, before everyone got here, was shooting out to a mile with his stalking rifle. 1,790 yards. Most people will zero their rifle at 100 yards. Mm -hmm. So yeah. everything, everything then is being enhanced and highlighted, whether it's the wind, drop, everything. I mean, how do you even get your rifle scope to have enough elevation adjustment to be able to hit the target? I mean, how much drop are you talking at 1,800 metres? At, at 1,794, um, we had on 76.5 MOA of elevation. And for the wind, during the three, uh, five shots that I fired, um, we had 30 and a half minutes of wind on. 76 MOA of elevation. Yeah. So one minute of angle is an inch at 100 metres, is that right? An inch at 100 yards. 100 yards. So that's um, 76 inches high at 100 yards. Yes. In order to hit the target. Yeah, yeah, basically. Um, we all do think it's different to a normal stalking rifle. We put a different mounting system on it from Third Eye Tactical with 30 MOA built into it. So we could get the bottom zero on the Night Force, which is a 22 mag, which has got an internal adjustment of 100 MOA. So basically I've started with the zero of the scope right at the bottom of its travel. To give maximum elevation. With that scope as the way it's set at the moment, I can dial 98 minutes of elevation straight off the, straight off the turret. So I can go from 100 yards, zero, where I can, go, where I can shoot my deer from things at two, 300 yards, and my varmint stuff at crows, foxes, pigeons and things at further distances and out to just dial in 96, 96 and a half minutes on for the long shot. But no, it works. Most rifle shots don't get the chance to test their shooting ability or the limits of their rifle, scope and ammo. And with good reason if you're shooting live quarry. But it's sensible to practice longer shots just in case you need to call on that skill in the field. Northampton Saints rugby star Scott Armstrong is a keen stalker. He's enjoying the opportunity of building his confidence at long range. I try to get out as often as I can with Chris, just get into uh, as many uh, little deer stalking forays as we can and a little bit of, bit of fishing as and when. Um, but yeah, I'm getting big into the, into the he's stalking and uh, Chris is getting into my rifles and he's getting his hands on my equipment and trying to ackle this and uh, play with this trigger and play with that trigger. and. Uh, so yeah, yeah, I'm getting into it and it's just nice to come out today and have a, have a few shots at long range and get a few targets shot and something a little bit different from, you know, the stalking. Like I said before, just normally uh, three shots 100 yards and then off, off you go and you little stalking for a and seeing some of the guns on, on display today, you know, it's quite impressive. But you've managed to obviously resist Mr Blackburn's attentions because that still looks to me very much like a sporting rifle. Yeah, it pretty much is. Um, straight out of the box, uh, Chris has done a, a good job on the trigger. Uh, helped me with the ballistic stuff and got me into reloading. Uh, it's paying dividends today, really. I mean, we, we played around with it yesterday. Um, got the um, got it all dialed in, and, and you know, managed to go out to six, seven hundred yards today, which is brilliant. Um, something that I obviously never done before with stalking. Um, but it's just you know nice to know you can reach those distances, um, you know, with, with, with your gear. Really, have a bit of faith in your gear, and you know, you know, given a circumstance, if you're stalking wherever you may be or foxing, you know, you just dial it in, and away you go. It's, you know, it makes change from say aiming at fresh air, hit fresh air kind of thing. Um, it's nice to dial in, be accurate and know you can get a job done. Dom's also making those gongs bong at distance. He has been featuring the development of his rifle in the mag as it's pimped by Chris. With ammo spent and battery levels on the iPhones falling, it's time for the raffle. Again, this year, there are some fantastic prizes and plenty of them. Incredibly, Dom wins a chance to relive his salmon fishing exploits on the Thurzo. The top prize of the Zeiss Duralit scope goes to John McLean, who was chief gopher on the Ferrari McNabb film. It couldn't have been won by a nicer guy. If you're watching this on YouTube, click on the screen to watch that film. If you want to find out more about the charity or to make a donation, go to jackjaysblackburn.co.uk. If you want to see Dom's full interview with Tom Wood talking rugby, his injury and his recovery thanks to bow hunting, click on this screen up here. Plus, if you want to see another rugby legend out stalking red deer, we've got Kieran Cunningham. Hit this button. Next, it's David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Britain News. It's Ewa this weekend, and I hear you ask, 
What's IWA? Well, it's the European version of the SHOT Show, held in a big exhibition centre in Nuremberg, where companies go to see, be seen, and to launch new hunting and shooting kits. This is what it looked like last year. We'll be there this year. Look out for new rifles and shotguns from the biggest brands in next week's Field Sports Britain. It's also Crufts this weekend at the NEC in Birmingham. Basque will be running the Working Gun Dog classes and reports a big rise in entries. Among new classes this year are Scrufts, the annual award for the best mongrel, and a Hero Dog Award. This is Bryn, a stray from Afghanistan, adopted by the Coldstream Guards in 2010 and trained to sniff out roadside bombs. He saved the lives of two soldiers. He now lives in Hailsham, East Sussex. George Digweed continues his clay shooting success in South Africa. Last week, we reported that he'd won the Pan-African FITASC Championship. Now he's clinched the Pan-African Compact Championship with a perfect score of 200 out of 200 over two days. Here are more big name sportsmen who also enjoy hunting. When not on the course, American professional golfer and star of the PGA circuit, Brian Harmon enjoys his next favorite thing, duck hunting with his brother. The PGA has just released this film about him. February is the month where the Kazakhstan Golden Eagle Championships takes place. The US government-backed radio station for Russia and the Middle East, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, has made a film about the 2013 event. Some 50 Kazakh falconers took part in the annual contest to prove their skill. The sport in which the eagles hunt rabbits and foxes on command is a Kazakh tradition that goes back centuries. And finally, when shooting in cold weather, it takes a Russian to train his dog to carry out this vital retrieve. Or look at it the other way round. Maybe Tsar, the German shorthead pointer, has trained his owner to give him biscuits in return for vodka. You are now up to date with Field Sports Britain News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Thank you, David. Now Zeiss makes the best optics in the world and one man who likes to have a pair of Zeiss binos around his neck is top bushcrafter, Ray Mears. With one of the best universities in the world, Cambridge is home to a few scientists. Now they have a few more. Zeiss's new centre is not only home to the people responsible for the UK side of their sports optics, such as our rifle scopes and binos, but those involved in things like high-tech microscopy, providing kit for the next winner of a Nobel Prize for Medicine, or lithography optics for those clever chaps who make microchips. One special guest invited to celebrate the opening of this building is Ray Mears. He's been lighting fires, carving canoes and building shelters across the world for British TV pleasure for years. He says his life and that of others is enriched by good optics. You have to say that the two greatest inventions have been the microscope and the binocular. I mean, they're, they're, they're astonishing what they enable us to see and understand. And I think that's the key. The, the greater the magnification, the greater the understanding. I think that, that's, a, that's almost a rule of nature. It's, it should be one of you know, the Newton's laws, really. And I think you can see that very clearly when you use uh, a binocular. A binocular enables you to locate things, to identify things. But it can sometimes be difficult to see what's really going on. But if you then put up a field scope, a spotting scope, and you, you then, having located the thing, you look in more detail, now you see what's going on. You see the, uh, the nuance, the emotion on the face of the creature that you're watching. You see more clearly what's happening. So your perception of nature improves with improved you know, optical performance. For hunters, of course, you know, who are having to make life or death decisions which have uh, a bearing on the population dynamics of an animal they might be managing, um, having good optics that work in low light is very important to make the right decision because that can be very difficult. So is there any one wildlife moment which stands out for him that would otherwise have gone unseen if it weren't for his ever-present binoculars? On a daily basis you see more detail, but I think one of the most fascinating things that I was able to see was um, we were filming a, the nest of a goshawk, and the goshawk was away from the nest and a blue tit was coming up and pinching little bits of down for its own nest. It was taking quite a risk. It's those sorts of details that otherwise you wouldn't see. So, you know, 
when you take the, you have to take the time to use the optic. I think that's the other thing. You have to, you know, plonk your back against a tree and 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 breathe in the environment. The more you see, you you're tying those pictures that your 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 optic nerves recording to the sounds that your ears are recording. So your your perception of what's going on through your auditory system is also improving because, you know, in in the forest where things are camouflaged, with experience of recorded in the brain, you you see with your ears and you hear with your eyes. Even though Ray likes his Zeiss binos and probably gets a free pair, that's not how these relationships work. Zeiss also wants feedback from their experts in the field. They're professionals and they won't use anything that they don't believe in. I mean, it, it's part of their professional working life. So have people like Ray is, is really added benefit to ourselves. And, and we also get feedback from these people. I mean, they're, they're using it as a tool. And if there's something that needs to improve, we can talk to them and, and we put our ideas forward to Germany. So, yeah, people like Ray Mears and, and other opinion leaders, yeah, their views are, are certainly important to us. The new Zeiss Centre should mean even better customer service. If you want help with Zeiss products, or you fancy buying a very expensive microscope to go with your Bunsen burner, or maybe even a planetarium, this is where to come. But this evening isn't all about lab coats. There are a few of the UK's great unwashed sporting journos too who are told to behave themselves, and definitely no touching. Later in the programme, we'll be using optics for real when we go out stalking fallow does. Now, from one centre of excellence to another, we're at the Glasgow Angling Centre, which has assembled stars from the world of fishing for its traditional game season opener. Glasgow Angling Centre has made its open weekend one of the highlights of the angling year. It attracts literally thousands of keen fishers to this part of Glasgow. And not just Ouija's, that's Glaswegian for Glaswegians. So forget the grand old rivers, the grand old men pouring whisky into the grand old rivers for the official start of the game fishing season in Scotland. It actually takes place here in central Glasgow at the Glasgow Angling Centre. John Wilson has been the angler's angling presenter of choice on British TV screens for more than 30 years. He retired last year, so why is he here? Uh, you know, I've been making TV programmes for the last 25 years and it's nice to see all the, the people and they come and they reminisce about which programme they liked or which one they didn't like. And, and uh, it's nice, it's, it's a constant um, nice thing to hear really from people. In the world of TV, what have you got coming up? I haven't. I've actually given it all up now. <laughs> like I said, I've done 25 years of, of appearing before the camera and uh, the pressure of it, um, because people, what people don't realise is when they see a, a series that they're watching this year, I filmed it last year, but during that same year I had to research what I'm going to be filming the following year. And so I've actually been doing twice that amount of work for all those years. And, you know, I'm 70 this year. It's nice to step down and let somebody else take it up. Let's go inside, and what a place it is. Nearly 150 miles today to come up to this store. We've come every year since the, the, this event started, and uh, it's a super place to come, really like it. From sharks to wiggly shrimps, there is something for everyone. It's more like a game fair than a shop. Scott McKenzie is a former spay casting champion and record holder. Today he designs rods for a living and shows them off at fishing events and game fairs up and down the country. This is now the, the biggest fishing tackle show in Europe and uh, it's a one-stop shop for absolutely everything, it really is. But it's a, um, it's a shop in Glasgow, how can it be the biggest tackle? Oh, it's amazing, you name it and we've got it in here, they really have, they've got all the top brands from right around the world. And a good thing with today is because you've got representatives from all the different tackle brands, um, you can actually try out all the products and stuff like that. So rather than just going into a shop and having the, you know, the sales assistant saying, you, well, sir, go for this one, today is a chance to, to see myself and other people who are associated with the brands who know the in-depth things about each individual product. Another expert is David McPhail, whose fly tying and dressing YouTube channel gets millions of views a month from keen fly tyres the world over. All these people watch YouTube for some reason, I don't know. It's uh, why I'm here. Simply because I enjoy tying flies. Uh, I've tried to pass that on. At one time I used to work in the Glasgow Angling Centre, so I got to know a lot of people over the years. Uh, fly tying is, in my view, 
a great mix. If you can tie flies and fly fish, you'll always enjoy the sport much more. He is dressing a streamer fly on a double hook for us and watch those nimble fingers go. There, the perfect salmon fly, says Davy. If you are interested in dressing a fly like this, click on the link on the screen to watch it slowed down and with Davy's expert commentary. Everyone you stop will tell you stories about fish they caught and fish that got away. And some know about almost every fish caught in the country, like the representative from Fish Pal. Customers can come and buy fishing, they can also come and check out their availability, they can check water levels, how many fish have been caught, and then when they've actually made a booking, they can either make a booking online or they can actually go and um, contact the owner and then what they can do is make a donation to the River Trust at the end. So we're helping to raise money for the different River Trusts as well. The tackle trade are here in force to enjoy the surely historic occurrence of Scotsmen and women willingly spending money, even on a sport they love. One of the things that I really enjoy about working with, with Glasgow Field Sports is, is the staff that they've got here. Um, the guys couldn't do more for you um, and, and anything you need, if you ask them, they're, they're willing to, to help. And, and I think that reflects through the customers. Um, and, and as you can see, it's a, it's a unique premises in the UK and it's, you know, it's got the capacity to be able to do something like this. So. Paul Devlin started what is now the Glasgow Angling Centre on a wheelbarrow in a Glasgow market. It's a business success story that now employs 90 people and it is born from a passion for the sport. It's our open weekend, it's our, our spring open weekend. Uh, it celebrates the start of the, the fishing season and it's good to get all the anglers um, and all the personalities together at the one time. OK, we're in central Glasgow here. Is this the kind of Glaswegian equivalent of pouring a bottle of malt into the River Tay? Yeah, as, from a retailer's point of view, yes. Right. To have a look around the shop from the comfort of your own home, go to fishingmegastore.com. And I walked away from that with this rather lovely fly from David McPhail. I'm looking forward to getting that wet. Now we really are racing around the country this week. Let's head back down to David Taylor's stalking ground near the M11 where he's out after fallow does as part of his car. It's Taylor's Travels. This week on Taylor's Travels, I'm stalking. I've been stalking this ground for three years and I'm lucky in having a healthy population of fallow, munchak and a few roe that I'm keeping safe. Uh, there are basically two woods here. One on tight and there's a bit of fan in the middle of the clearing. Generally what happens is the deer will cross from one to the other. So we'll go up on this side and set up an high seat and wait for them to cross. So we'll just work our way down there now, very quietly. We eventually reach the high seat, and it's not long before I'm down. I've spotted a fallow deer in the floodplain behind us. You can just see the fallow have just gone across there, and that's the edge of the permission. So that's the next landowner over there. So we'll just walk out there, we'll see if we can see where they've gone, if they're all coming this way. The white doe makes life a lot easier in spotting the herd. Well, the deer that's just on the other side of the boundary have just started to bed down now. So they're obviously not moving anywhere for now. So what we'll do, we'll go back up into the high seat and see what we can see, because there might be some mud jack or there might be some other deer around. And with a bit of luck, they will start to come back this way and we'll catch up them later. Another couple of visits up the high seat and the fallow move off, and so do we. The wood often offers up a mud jack or two and I've recently installed a trail camera which has captured a few on the move. I'm hoping to bump into the original herd of fallow, but instead we come across another, larger herd, which we later discover has been spooked by some ploughing. I'm also pleased to see my row about, which are in their usual spot, although I'm a bit worried I'm missing a doe. As the morning marches on, it would seem that all we've done is spot deer, not shoot them. But then our perseverance pays off and we find the herd with the buck. They know something is up, which is why we're taking it slowly. 
I get myself up as high as I can on the sticks and wait for an opportunity. I want an animal on its own, away from the rest of the herd. We had the herd there. There were lots of them. They were all grouped together. It's very hard to try and pick one out because they're all standing so close together. We've also got so many eyes watching us, so it's very difficult to see. You know, to try and get up and get into a position where you can shoot safely, but also at the same time, shoot one and shoot the right one and shoot it cleanly. So we've got one down, uh, the rest of the herd's gone. We've reloaded, it's gone down over there. We should go and follow up on that now. The shot is good. The 308 has done its job. <sighs> Definitely dead. Shot on the shoulder. Came out a little bit far back there. You can see it went in just there. You just drag it to the edge of the field and uh, get some work done. But this is a uh, youngish one. She's, uh, you know, in good condition. Uh, it's a good one to take. There's obviously there's plenty of them there. So, uh, and the, the whole point of being here and managing these deer is to keep their number down or numbers down because, and you can see we're surrounded by farmland and too many of them can cause lots of issues for the farmer. They can eat the crops when they're actually lying in the crops. They lie down in them and wreck them. And it's, it's not been a very good year for farming because of the weather. So, uh, you know, it's all the more important to keep these deer numbers down as much as possible. And obviously you have to be, you know, control and make sure the uh, herds are correctly managed to make sure there's a good population of both males and females in there. So uh, today, a good day to take a doe. And you can see everything's looking very healthy. The liver just there. A bit of a fleck on there, but nothing looks too serious at all. I mean, that's a very healthy animal, a very, a very good one to take and one that would actually go to the game dealer and uh, can go into the food chain and then people can enjoy the venison that comes from this. So we're, we're serving two purposes really, sort of we're looking after the, the deer herd, uh, we're looking after the farmer as well, but also we're putting food into the food chain. This is uh, free range deer and certainly, certainly not horse. Of course, I'm using lead ammunition, which is becoming a more pressing issue, especially in Europe, with a big push towards alternatives. Although there is some evidence from Europe and from America about lead getting into the food chain and actually causing concern for both human health and for wildlife health, it's very important to put things into perspective. The Countryside Alliance, along with FACE, are monitoring this situation both in the UK and in Europe to ensure that there isn't an overall lead ban and to make sure that any evidence which is submitted is thoroughly scrutinised. It might have taken a good few hours and miles and I'm really pleased we saw so many deer. Altogether, it's been a very enjoyable morning. From a doe cull in the south of England to the wider world of hunting, shooting and fishing on YouTube. It is Hunting YouTube. This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the best hunting, shooting and fishing videos that YouTube has to offer. For some long form entertainment that would be much, much better if only you speak Turkish, and perhaps you do, watch this group of shooters drive through Thrace to Romania for the goose shooting. Soundtrack is Chris Rear's Road to Hell, and it's true there is a lot of driving in this 25 minute film, but there is a lot of shooting too. Staying in the former Eastern Bloc, Wild Boar Challenge Croatia by British based hunting agent Tomo Svetic of Artemis hunting shows a hunt for a trophy wild boar in the Balkans with an American client. If you think hunting dangerous game in Africa is exciting, this film captures the thrills and the spills of the European equivalent with the added benefit of hound work. Lid Media contacts me from Norway to say how much he likes field sports Britain, especially Roy Lupton's tips on fox shooting. Beaver Yacht 2011 is a film he makes about beaver hunting, and I like that. It's wet work with shotguns and rifles. Our cameraman Nicky Brown has a new fishing film out on his own channel 
channel. It's a review of the Manningford trout fishery outside the village of Pusey in Wiltshire. He is fly fishing for rainbow trout, brown trout, blue trout and grayling on lakes and the lovely River Avon. And now the fishing film that may change your life, or at least it may change your dab fishing technique. Fishing for flatfish GoPro underwater footage shows reeking haddocks, great channel name, fishing for dabs in Shetland including underwater footage using a homemade mount attached to the GoPro HD2 camera which shows exactly how dabs take bait. The Gamekeeper student documentary is a film from 2011 showing a day in the life of Scottish gamekeeper Tam Cullen. It is an amateur PR film for gamekeeping but shows lots of keepering technique and its heart is firmly in the right place. Now to Canada as this film rolls you see a herd of caribou bulls coming the shooter's way. He does not waste the opportunity and takes three of them. You are with him all the way. Finally I am warming to Tex Grebner. He likes double rifles when most other hunters don't and here he is displaying his muscles on a 100 pound recurve bow from White Wolf Archery when many would choose a compound bow and some clearly prefer an assault rifle. He writes, well Charlie don't be offended but the U war bow was the mass produced AK-47 of the day. You can click on any of these films to watch them if you have a YouTube film you would like us to pop into the weekly top 8 send it in via YouTube or email me the link charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv we are back next week when I'll be looking at the latest gun show kit on the market at Nuremberg's greatest gun show. And I'll be learning how to use this, my old catty, with YouTube's top slingshot artist, Jörg Sprava. That's him doing something ridiculous on the screen up there. You can click through to his films from there. You can click to subscribe to us below that. You can click to go through to our website below that, where you can like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, or best of all, scroll down to the bottom, pop your email address into our constant contact box, and we'll be in touch with you every week about our programme that's out at 7pm Wednesdays. This has been Field Sports Britain.